Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino's English Show, episode number 312. That's 312, not 512, not 612, not 712, not 8, not 912, and definitely not 10,001 and 2, right? Or what is that? How do you pronounce that? Is that 1200, right? I don't know, whatever. It's 312. Thank you so much for joining back into the Agassino Zynga show with me, myself, your host, Agassino Zynga. What's going on? How are you doing? Great. Hope you're feeling good. Hope you're feeling fine. Oh, if you're listening to this, right, and you're wondering to yourself, wow, the audio sounds incredible. Agassino's up the audio. He's finally invested in this stuff that he does all the time, in it. For his kind of hordes of listeners. Yes, you are right. I got myself a brand new mic. If you're listening via the podcast, you should be able to hear a, a marked difference from the stuff I was using prior. Um, it's called a Rode Pod Mic. I'll hold up the camera so you can see. If you're not watch listening, then what you're doing, head over to YouTube. But this is the vid- this is the actual thing. Hold on. If you can see that, you should be able to get my voice a little bit because it's a good condenser mic. But yeah, it's pretty sturdy. It's pretty hefty. As you can see, I made the mistake of not checking all the specs and finding out what actually works for it. So I bought the mic and then had to end up buying a a little audio interface for it. I had to buy some cables. And now I need a mic stand because, you know, holding it like this in my hand might interfere with the sound. But hopefully if I stay still, you should be able to hear me loud and clear. But yeah, um, I've got a new pod- podcasting mic now. I'm really happy with it. Um, it costs about £99, I think about $100. It's sort of like the industry standard road. But they've made a quasi portable one that you can use, especially if you have like a laptop stand or so, uh, sorry, like a desk stand. It would work pretty well. So I'm glad I'd be able to up the little quality on this little podcast here and there because I think most people would agree that the video quality can be whatever because sometimes depending on the lighting i have in here and because i zoom in on the frame to make sure i crop out some of the background the bit rate can go anywhere between 480 to 720 and sometimes 1080p depending but um of course if i frame it up better than it would if i and if i actually fit the camera to the actual frame it would be a lot more crisper quality but i think when it comes to these sort of clips online the most important thing i think when i'm watching them is to have clear audio make sure you can actually hear the person and when they're enunciating or speaking is probably the most important thing so i thought you know what let's update the microphone and for the longest time i was using a standard thing i got from amazon for like 30 pound 40 pound it came with a mic it came with a stand all in one unit just plug and play into a usb so this is you know probably the time that you need to kind of invest in these kind of things because i'm a big believer in sometimes just doing what you can with what you have available and then as you get more experience as you start to learn how to use the equipment you increase it bit by bit i hope you can hear me, hope you can hear me from here i've got a little microphone gain here but yeah um yeah that's that's my update basically that's been the most exciting thing that's happened as you can tell i'm rabbing on about buying a microphone from amazon like whoopie do apart from that i've been getting back into my routine training a bunch i started reading this book by this guy called james clear i'm gonna say it's called um atomic habits see if i can pop up on my phone here so you guys can see it's a way of mirroring your phone on here right screen mirroring what happens when i do that screen mirroring doesn't work does it anyway it doesn't work but let me just show you so this is it it's called atomic habits can you see that da, da, da. can you see that nope can you see that can you see this nope and you try to get up on a website it's called atomic habits by this guy called james clear i'm on about what chapter 17 at the moment so going little by little slowly atomic habits let me see if i can get up on here So it's a really great book. I think I've found it via Sam Harris's podcast. I've got it here on the screen. Um, Essentially, uh, it's by Atomic Habits, an easy proven way to build good habits and break bad ones by this guy called James Clear, who I guess is quite popular within the self-help, quantified self-movement sort of, you know, crew. Um, I've probably read this kind of book or an iteration of the book similar to this, you know, 17 million times over the years especially since i've been you know in uh, since i've been um deep in the whole uh self-improvement world but sometimes along the way you tend you tend to lose your way you tend to get a little bit distracted um you tend to kind of let things fall by the wayside and i felt as if the last few months or maybe yeah maybe the last few months actually they've i've not really been at it where i was previously right my level of like um output my level of um i would say proficiency in the things that i was doing was higher 
my consistency was obviously at a much higher level and just the amount of output right the things that i was doing day in day out, i built these habits that i had in place that just kind of framed allowed me to have a kind of a foundation during my week because sometimes you know when you're working a nine to five and you're doing the slog and you're doing the commute and everything seems the same i like to have these little blocks either side of my working schedule that allow me to have some kind of uh you know um, habit building process a way to kind of unplug get out of you know thinking about work stuff or talking about work stuff and just kind of building up and it, it doesn't even need to be a side hustle like or side project just something on the side just for you to do to keep your mind occupied and it feels if the last few months have just been a bit you know i've been a bit lax it could be due to loads of you know life things happening but in general i probably just took my foot off the pedal so i thought best way to get myself back onto the saddle and get back on it again was to read a new book a new fresh take on what it means to build good habits and this book so far is you know built breaking down incentive based goals the idea that you should be focusing on process not the end goal which is something i've definitely been um thinking about a lot lately and just generally uh, creating um creating loads of ways designing your lifestyle in a way that makes it likely so because willpower is a very day we say right willpower is something that you can't really bank on so you have to create um you have to put things in your life that allow you to make the right decisions or decisions that you think is most optimal at the time whether that means you know making sure you cook lunch during the week so that you feel guilty about wasting it and buying lunch at work or whether it's making sure you don't have any alcohol at home so you don't drink loads of little things that you can do that can just help things you know like i remember once when i was starting to get when i was starting on my running thing i used to put my um running shoes next to my phone so wherever my phone was when it went off i would have my i'd have to kind of go through my shoes to get my phone or you know better yet just put your phone inside your shoe when it's charging so that when you pick it up you automatically you, re you recognize you've got your shoes there, so it just automatically clicks you into there right or the idea that the only time i take a shower during the week is after i came back from a workout from the gym or going for a run so i kind of already built those process and so this kind of book does speak about the same sort of things um he's you know it seems like an easy read i'm already on chapter 16 i've listened to it being an audio book performer i think these books you don't really need to listen read them in their physical form maybe that you know there is an idea that you could gain something by highlighting some sections dog in some sections and stuff but i think it kind of reads essentially like a really really long podcast so if you want to just get a kind of framework get back onto the saddle get things back aligned i recommend you check it out um again it's called um atomic habits an easy and proven way to build and to build good habits by this guy called james clear as you can see down the screen so if you want it definitely check it out anyway moving on in nothing else is up to update really in it on the scene i think everywhere is closed we've got no we've got no scene at the moment um we're in a position now where boris is trying to get things restarted people are arguing about it but you know that's not something i want to speak about right now i think it's getting a bit boring going on about the old corona every single day so i'm going to get into some more interesting topics that i think are of note so number one um something i thought was funny was um I'm not sure I think it was funny. Yeah, let me go into this one first. This is an article from The Guardian. And it says supposedly there's some runners out there that are opposing, joggers are opposing, oh no, drug dealers are opposing as joggers. Drug dealers are opposing as joggers, right? Yeah, drug dealers are opposing as joggers in order to circumvent the lockdown order that's why nationwide, which is funny because if there's one thing that we've it's proven, because I've heard rumors, again, I'm not in that position, but I've heard rumors of people linking up doing these like undercover house parties barbecues going to the park meeting or just hooking up with people on tinder dates and shit i've heard some of some wild 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 activities going on out there um which you know is which i'm not really one for tittle tattle i'm not one for like telling people what not to do and i think some people that are on that kind of vein you have to be understanding of just how weird of a situation it is that we're in at the moment isn't it i have sympathy for people if people want to break the rules and go outside and you know and risk it more power to you and it just don't come around me i just you know whatever it is what it is i think people have been indoors for too long um and to expect people to kind of suddenly you know give up everything they know and love because of this phantom disease that they have no you know reference to i don't think that's likely so if people want to go out and you know break the rules whatever i, I don't care what can, what can i do but i thought this story was quite funny um it basically again it shows that you know people that want to get it in people that want to go out will find a way around it and people that want to get their drugs will find a way around it too it is from the guardian it says here uh drug dealers drug dealers posing as 
joggers they and the NHS staff in in COVID nineteen lockdown. It says here, uh, drug dealers are posing as joggers or using fake NHS ID badges to continue their trade during the COVID nineteen lockdown. An expert <laughs> on gangs has found. So Professor Simon Harding, director of the National Centre for Gang Research at the University of West London, said that County Lands gangs were finding new ways of doing business, which is mad in it. So I think County Lands, I'm assuming, are those dudes that, you know, they basically operate within the county lines to take a brick from here go up to some random place up north uh post up get a trap and start flanging that work it continues it says uh many dealers were heeding government advice on physical distancing turning to social media drive-by sales or letterbox shops to avoid infection he said mad in it um I, it must be surprised isn't it people are in a funk people are in a mood they're not really happy with the current situation they've lost their jobs they've not seen their friends or they're on furlough which is probably worse than losing your job probably right the idea that you're just at home not doing anything um and especially if you've got fear that you might get sacked later on being in that kind of employment purgatory is no fun so imagine all that stuff going on right you might have not seen especially if you're close to, you're really close to your family you're not seeing them or close to your friends you're not seeing them or just imagine if you're one of the people who had you were living in a flat share and all of a sudden you have to move back home like and that's not even in the uk that's in another country with your parents you haven't seen or heard from in a couple of years and siblings that have all grown up it's just a weird dynamic you have to suddenly go back home now so i think that must be weird so people are definitely going to turn to because i remember seeing a stat about um frozen food sales have gone up during the coronavirus lockdown so as alcohol sales and i'd imagine drugs as well right because people just want to you know there's only so much netflix only so much youtube only so many books you can read until you just want large chunks of the day to just zip on by which now makes me understand why people got addicted to xanax remember there was a period in time where xanax was the thing you know everyone was popping xanax and everyone was, and the people that weren't doing it were like oh, i can't believe people do that look how it makes you look you look all munged out people get hooked on it really quickly but for the user because most drugs in it there's not, I don't think there's a drug that exists, maybe even weed, there's no drug that exists that is enjoyable for the person that's not doing it, it doesn't, right, <clears throat> doesn't exist, even alcohol, you you know, if you're not drinking and you're around people that are drinking, it's like, it's maybe one of the most annoying things, it's probably up there with a gaggle, you know, Friday night on Little Bushy Station, that gaggle of, you know, a horde of women who sound like a gaggle of geese, parading around little bushy station complimenting each other's outfits pretending to fall over whilst they carry the little cans of you know m and uh alcohol pops they're probably a close second but number one number one that is up there with how you know just oh up there is super annoying but anyway what can you do let's continue um so uh but some have dressed as joggers to avoid police detection while others have made nhs fake badges to continue street dealing the quote says here on one hand they really are heeding they really are heeding government advice on social distancing, but at the same time, it's a business as usual. As people were panic buying food, dealers were running bulk deals and selling lockdown party packs, which is odd, isn't it? Because I think when you've got high once at home, if you've ever been high once at home, especially in a party mood, or you've done it more than once, maybe twice, three times, four times, you have to come to the realization that there's nothing like getting on it when you're outdoors. Indoors is like, what's the point in it, really? And it? it's like, i don't know maybe weed is different but party pack sort of stuff you kind of need to at least have a bit of an outside experience and then if you come back from an after it's fair enough but just doing your whole thing indoors at home is super dead unless you, i don't know you've got some sort of like basement discotheque or something it doesn't really bang the same i'd imagine even i'd imagine even worse nowadays because you're not necessarily because i don't know it, maybe it's just me but it's like i'm not a birthday person right but I'd imagine the worst time to celebrate your birthday is when you're in a bad mood, isn't it? Like, everything just is bad, right? You don't necessarily feel in a good way. You don't feel like uh, having fun. So I imagine the same thing would work. The same thing would apply if you are doing drugs at home. Like, it's not the most... It's not, unless, you're, unless, you're, unless you work in a job that you actually hate and they decide to furlough you, so you're getting paid and you have loads of cool, fun housemates to chill with, right? or like a nice cool family they like hanging out with that's the only time i think those pie packs will make more sense because then every friday you and your friends or every day is a friday essentially you could turn it into like a little mini house rave right but how off how long will that last 
like it, it will get dead after a while. I don't know. Maybe it's me, but I just never got the idea. I just never got where I'd sitting at home doing drugs was fun. It's not fun. You just do it because you want to do it. But I don't think it's fun. It can never replace going out, right? Because part of the reason, part of the ecstasy, part of the uh, thrill of going out is seeing other people. You know, the lights, the bass, the queuing up outside. You know, getting searched, club room, all that stuff is adds to the actual um night and then when you sprinkle on some class a's or b's it might just take it to another level but to just do the entire rave at home not for me boss it continues um the article says here vehicles have been used more often to carry out deals arranged by the firm with products thrown from windows and money chucked on the back seat to keep the items clean that is a madness harding said that the lockdown and travel restrictions were affecting the country lines um, gang model in which the young vulnerable people were being used as couriers to move drugs and cash between cities and smaller towns i don't think it's only young and vulnerable people i think ev everyone does county lines they're making it seem as if like it's like a child sex ring or something operating on there but hey the new tactics have been led to a reduction in cuckooing what's that what's that mean cuckooing 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 whereby gang members take uh care over the home of a vulnerable person to cut sort and deal drugs because it's seen as too risky for health okay sending groups of young adults out to south end on sea by train to carry drugs is too risky now so increasingly dealers are driving runners around or hiring local people to do the job street gangs are being forced to find new tactics such as shifting grooming and recruiting online to social media this means young people can become ensnared in dangerous gang activity from their phones while their families have no idea what's worrying oh shut up last month the national crime agency director lynn owen said prices were rising because fewer drugs were entering the uk which is definitely true i think that's probably that probably has more sense in it i don't think you're gonna stop how, how are they gonna what they're gonna start arresting you know the government's already on a bad in a the government's already doing things you know badly here in the uk they the last thing you want is more eyes on you when you start pushing you know up some local nurse against the wall and searching her pockets because you think she might be carrying a couple bricks that isn't the right way to go about things i'd imagine again who what do i know uh but yeah i thought that was pretty interesting you know off the back of this uh lockdown people are out there getting it in um they're out there making sure that they get their party packs and their raving dolls which i think is you know the epitome of sad but hey people have their way of doing things let's move on what else do i see is interesting on a list betty with uh, some tips for djs which was pretty cool he put out a little bit a little tweet fred um for people i'm assuming a lot of djs are at home thinking mulling over things and seeing how they can become of use after the lockdown because i imagine a lot of people's careers will change in it I would imagine for everyday people like you and I, right? Um, every uh, your average everyday civilian who goes to work and just clocks in and clocks out, our life will change. Um, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. But for sure, if you work in the entertainment industry, there's no shadow without a shadow of a doubt, your life's going to change. Because sometimes, even if you have like a really collectively, if you have like a dead month, no, sorry, a dead year, like where you know everyone agrees that it wasn't the best you know bookings were down overall maybe a terrorist attack happened maybe you know um maybe the uh, the economy of some country crashed whatever right something happens that affects everybody it usually means that some people have to start you know making some pivots in their career maybe they go you know behind the scenes maybe they go entirely back to, maybe go back to school move into an entirely new area of life entire area of in their career whatever right people make those kind of changes every year sometimes so if some occasion like this happens which i think is probably given people an excuse who probably weren't necessarily that into it anyway you know the long flights the missing birthdays missing weddings and shit because i can imagine i can imagine you know being a dj professionally would be a dream job or course which i would love to do but also know that if you have a small family or if you come from a very family oriented background or if you just have a good friends it'd be quite um it's be a big sacrifice to just miss out on you know really crucial moments in their life because you're pursuing your dreams so if this event happens where it kind of makes you think you know what i live in a pretty cool city and uh, maybe you live in madrid maybe you live in you know what you call it you live in brighton bristol whatever right um you've got a few local gigs you can do on the weekend you might just think you know what i'm just going to keep it inland 
I'm going to play up and down the country, do a couple of festivals here and there and make sure I collect my coin that way. But I don't need to be, you know, playing every other weekend in some <laughs> ditch somewhere in the middle of Amsterdam for some sweaty teenagers, isn't it? Like, you know, or you just probably have those sets available anyway in general. They'll probably be going to local people who they can pay less for and don't have to, you know, um, have the risk of having the whole event thrown off because, you know, someone catches the COVID. But I thought this thread was pretty interesting anyway, regardless. He gave some insights on some stuff that I thought I've been thinking about myself. He started off here. He says, I don't see people trying to I don't see people trying to talk about how to approach learning to DJ very often. And when I do, it feels like it's extremely binary between YouTube vids talking about record box, hot cues and loops. Uh, this house is a feeling. And if you don't use vinyl, you're a fraud because I say so. Which is true, isn't it? I think coming into it, but it depends c what it is, because I think DJing a lot like comedy it depends what you are in it for. What what are your entry points exactly, right? Because I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's different in scenes, but I don't think anyone comes into like electronic the, the stuff that I listen to anyway, di disco, house, techno, and uh, immediately says, "Ah, uh, I want to go play somewhere." I don't think that's necessarily the thing that happens don't probably go i want to go play in this massive warehouse venue i don't think that's the actual vibe i think you get into it first find out what genre works the best for you find out what scene you like the best and then from there you figure out a way of getting involved whether it's you know designing flyers taking pictures being a dog guy dog girl working as a bartender whatever you probably work it out that way but even if you do you might have let's say you do decide to get into it and just be a dj straight away there'll be people that you follow that you'll then kind of uh, base your career on i remember when i got into it my kind of reference points at the beginning were like you know seth Troxler, ricardo villalobos jamie jones uh richie horton uh jeff mill dj hell ben clock like that's the people i remember first seeing like watching them talk uh, the answer and talk about djing right and i was like okay cool i want to do that and then from there you see how they play and then you kind of frame the way you play or the way you select uh based on what you see your heroes doing or sometimes you might just straight up copy them for a while until you just until you realize oh actually it's better if i just get my own style and then from that building block of copying them you build out your own style you get your own influences you, you define your own taste and you start going from there so it's quite hard to take any value if anything from those videos you see online or on youtube about loops i think they work well if you do like if you want to add to your kind of proficiency because i think you know once you get into it you'll be a proficient dj right when you start buying tunes and mixing every weekend you'll be able to mix and blend you'll be able to go from like point a to point b but then if you want to add more layers to it because i remember that's what something dvs once said i remember him saying right um he's he plays a lot of the Berghain, um I'm pretty sure he's Canadian or American, I forgot, but he lives in Berlin. And I remember he made a really good point in an interview where he said, um, digital, DJing on the USB is all good and all well and good. I think there's a debate about vinyl v, vinyl v uh, CDJs or vinyl v USBs. But he said the issue is that because it's, cause the tech is so advanced, people are quite lazy and they don't do a lot behind the decks. And I think the US ones are really um physical dj right he's always there manipulating shit right always on the filters uh, uh making sure he, the 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 beats are matching up and shit um he's not just kind of blending in, in and out he's really getting in in the weeds there when he's mixing and he said that if the gear is making things easier you should be doing things on top of it to really differentiate yourself so it doesn't just sound like a, a spotify playlist for instance right um which i really took to heed and i think if you're able to take some of those lessons online about doing loops and stuff and then add that to your kind of base level of dj you you could then be on another level because i think most people even the pros who are playing on the festival circuit they don't really do much right they they kind of they kind of phone it in a bit they go up, play their play their playlist that they prepared, or even maybe they didn't prepare the same thing they played yesterday in another venue, in another part of the world, and just play it from front to back again, which is why they look so bored behind the decks usually. But if you can maybe add some kind of you know some loops, some effects to your set that aren't too cheesy, that when it works out. But again, it's hard to kind of skirt to keep on that line in it between doing things that are like cool and doing things that are like corny or a bit cheesy. And he continues here. He says in this thread, he says, um, I've been borrowing some new pioneer stuff for the past couple of weeks and it's made me think about DJ tech and how I would approach teaching the skills I've 
uh, feel like I've acquired over the last 15 years or so. But with the access to all the new stuff, it's available now. I tried to make a start by writing something about it very briefly. So I clicked post quickly, show you what he wrote here. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, he says it follow. Um, it might sound basic, but I still think that one of the best things you can do if you're learning to DJ is to cover up the BPM readers and learn to mix uh, by ear. There are some, there are a few reasons for this, and none of them are about authenticity or elitism. What equipment you've decided to start using? Most newer DJing technology has been designed to streamline the experience of playing music, but technology will always let you down occasionally, whether it's down to the flow in the tech itself or in the errors made in the preparation to use that tech. If you're relying on working on it working perfectly, then you won't be able to correct errors by ear when they do happen. If you can learn to mix by ear, you'll end up with a more intuitive understanding of why a blend might be working or why it might not be, despite the BPM matching, which is definitely true. And I think that's something that you learn. And again, it depends on who you get into. I think if you get into the more eclectic DJs, like if you start listening to DJ Harvey, that's kind of your first entry point. I think that's probably a good thing because what will end up happening or like a Boris, yeah, from another Burger and Panama Bar resident because they usually do that thing where they never play a record because they, they don't do BPM writing, right? Which is something a lot of people do when they get into it, which is probably why a lot of people don't like Tech House because a lot of those guys are BPM writers. They just sit on like 115 to 125 and that's it. And it doesn't really go anywhere and all the tracks sound the same. So... If you're able to actually uh, refine your taste in music, build up a repertoire of stuff that you like to play, and you're able just to play whatever that fits into the set and the sound, you'll avoid doing the BPM matching. But I think what uh, ben, uh, Benny first said here is very true about just mixing in general. I remember even when I was using my, excuse me, my laptop or using a MIDI player at the beginning, I would always just, well, especially when I was using it at home, I would always turn off the waveforms, number one, or I'll take off the BPMs because obviously if you have the waveforms up, you can just match, you know, you can match the bass lines, match the hi-hats, match the snare, whatever on the count of one, two, three, four, on the count of one, sorry. And you can essentially be mixing effortlessly without even, you know, having any headphones in. But when you get take, get rid of the waveform and maybe even the BPM if you're that confident and just start mixing and start kind of using your ears to figure out where the pitch should be it then refines your ear a bit better and then you're able then to maybe mix stuff in that just might feel right but maybe isn't the right bpm like i'll play a techno set and there'll be like a song that i want to play that's like 98 bpm it doesn't necessarily it doesn't match up bpm wise but it actually sounds quite close to it right so you would then be able to just hit that mix that onto the one flip it in and it works straight away so if you get into the more eclectic dudes like i've done lena wilkins is a good example of that too they have a really good way of just playing whatever into their set kind of like a radio dj would right um they'll just play whatever and then you know next one song will be a slow jam next song will be like a fist in there i think that's that's that is really my experience for the time that i've been djing it's been about what 10 years or so that's what separates the the kind of average from the good I would say the ability to just play whatever in the set and make it work, make it sound right. And then for the top level, obviously, so the taste in music really is what separates everybody else. And it continues here. The article says um, two tracks can be mathematically in time with each other, but can sound like carnage if the rhythmic emphasis, which is, you know, he's more of a nerd than me in this, but it definitely makes sense here. He says, but, um, but they can sound like carnage if the rhythmic emphasis across the track is very different. If you've learned to mix by ear, you'll eventually be better equipped to think about what songs will fit together effortlessly and which will require a heavier handed approach in a mix. Or if you decided that car crashes and heavy clangs are key to your aesthetic, you'll be able to implement them with intention. It says here, if you mix by ear, you can also you also don't have to do as much tedious laptop admin preparing your set, which I definitely agree. You don't need to sit in record box or serato for as long. You'll be able to trust yourself to improvise and you'll feel more relaxed in the club itself as a result. That's why I like to, this is something backwards, but when I prepare my sets, that's why I like to use iTunes. So I'll go into iTunes. There might be some albums I've downloaded recently or sometimes I'll just download loads of EPs, buy loads of stuff online and I'll chuck them into playlists of stuff, of just some genres like wide, like kind of wide range. Hmm. Like I've got genres, I've got genre playlists that, you know, I'll label disco, new disco, techno, deep house, house, duh, 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 vintage, whatever, soulful house. I'll just, you know, those are kind of some loose headings. I'll chuck whatever I can in there. And then when I want to, when I want to go out for a set, imagine I'm playing on a Friday and this is Monday. Um, 
I would just essentially go through the folders or the check the new stuff that I've added onto it and just add that to another playlist of that's going to go to the USB. And the stuff that I've got in that, in those kind of like playlists, those kind of crates, quote unquote, they're not, you know, they're not all the same BPM. I've not, I've spent, I've not, ma I've not kind of categorized them or sorted them by BPM. They're just in there as tunes so that when then, so then when I drag them onto record box, I can then have a good idea about the flow I'm going for. And then what I'll notice more like in a, more often than not is that usually the peak hour stuff that I've kind of picked out is the same BPM, but the stuff in the middle, stuff in the start, is just completely all over the place. And that comes from that kind of learning. So that's a good way to kind of go about preparing stuff if you, you know, want any advice from me. And it continues here. It said it's hard to articulate this kind of thing without sounding like a hippie. And this is mostly just a personal observation. But a big part of what's kept me engaged with this so for so many years is that when uh, I'm really enjoying a set, I can get into some kind of flow state through playing the music. When I can get to the state, I feel at that I feel at one with the vibes, quote unquote. Um, it's effortless and it feels like I'm inside the music. But if I'm overwhelmingly focused on the functionality of CDJs and on stuff I prepared in record box, it's harder to get to that place. And it can feel more just like uh, another numb screen, a numb, numbing screen based activity. And crucially, that makes the end results sound different, which I definitely agree with. Um, again, I think a lot, a lot more people should probably concentrate on just making sure they get, you know, they develop a good taste in music. I think that's probably more important than going on Beatport and just downloading whatever else is, have is, is playing and playing that. That's super boring. But then once you've done that, obviously the next step is to definitely go for, um, you know, go for this approach where you can mix whatever you just, you just have the ability to do it because you know, it sounds right. As opposed to just riding the BPM, which is definitely a mistake I've seen people doing when they start off things, but you know, you've got to start somewhere, I guess. Anyway, let's continue here. What else I see that's interesting on the night, the internet, da, 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 da. Let's, mean to, let's see some news here regarding the scene. If there's any information, what's happened, or clubs opening. I think there's a few, a few, right? Maybe Denmark or something. Let's see what's been going on here. Who's been opening? Who's, oh, this is from Resident Advisor, right? It says, how countries plan to restart nightclubs and music festivals. The UK said what? They shared a 60-page document of our plan to rebuild today, May 11th. So the other day that includes a three step plan for phasing in the UK lockdown with the first action from today, the second of the third address. It addresses the hospitality sector, which I'm involved in. It says referencing pubs and restaurants under the category of food service providers, which are planned to partially reopen at the in that first stage. However, it does state some venues which are by design crowded and where it may prove difficult to enact social distancing may still be able to reopen safely at this point so what's what any dates here no no dates no nothing so we haven't got an indication for the uk but i think what's going to happen most likely than not people are probably not going to boy around right once we're allowed to kind of have people around our houses people will probably do that there'll be a lot of illegal raves like i said before loads of squat raves will pop up um out of the woodwork once things are a little bit cooled down and people stop snitching on people or stop being telltales and then the other side of it that I think will be very interesting is once we're allowed to fly again, I think we'll see a lot more people deciding to just, start, you know, down stick, especially if they can work remotely and just go and party somewhere where it's open. If you go to Spain, parts of Germany, I'm assuming France will probably be cool. Italy by then might be all right. There'll be places that you can go in mainland Europe that you can just go and party your head off and come back um, after a few bevies or two. Um, it says here for South Korea, after South Korea recently relaxed social distancing measures, including allowing clubs to reopen, there's been a spike in COVID infection, first enough clubs to close. Yeah, that's about that story about that guy going into a club and infecting like 40 people. That was grim. Australia here with, uh, with under 10,000 reported cases. Wow, Australia is considering reopening its economy. Restrictions around the gatherings have been lifted in some states. The Falls Festival has announced its New Year's Eve edition will happen with an all Australian lineup. Yeah, that makes more sense. That's what I think will happen anyway once everything gets sorted out i think a lot of these festivals and clubs will have to change their programming and their lineup and go for a lot more local based artists or people within their community um just because of just for cost sake right because you, if you come off the back of six months or so six months more six months plus right of no income no people coming in through the door no one buying drinks at the bar you're gonna you're not gonna be in a place where you can pay you know x 
XYZ international artist to come in and slay your dance floor. You might need to just call in some favors to some friends and get three or four, four, three or four people, three or four people to play for the same money that it would get for the person to play the other guy to play um from abroad and stuff. It says here for Denmark, borders of Denmark remain closed for foreigners, but museums and theatres and zoos will begin opening on June 8th. Bars, nightclubs and small concert venues will need to wait until sometime early August, Mom, which is again pretty cool for them. I think their numbers are pretty low as well. And Netherlands is another one we will probably be interested in. It says Netherlands Minister of Public Health sent a letter to the House representative saying mass events at a national level may only be allowed with the existence of a vaccine. Um, concert halls and theatres, however, will be allowed to take pl take groups of 30 people. With the previous reservation of social distancing starting June 1st, groups of 100 will be allowed to gather on July 1st. It depends how it depends how desperate you are to go out, innit? I don't think I'd go out with just 30 people. It's not worth it. Social distancing in the pub makes no sense, right? I'm standing behind some little bit of tape, shouting over across to my mate whilst I drown my s sorrows in cider. It doesn't make no sense. Part of the reason why pubs work, especially in this country, is because, you know, there is a lack of personal space, you know, talking to someone you don't know, uh, bumping into an old friend, or just generally catching up with friends that you know and love. You know, in close proximity, maybe spilling a little bit of some or some of your beer on someone's shoe, having that little bantery moment. That's what makes that place special. Having, you know, standing behind things or having chairs or stools that you can't sit down in, it's just not the vibe for me. And I'd rather go out when things kind of settle down for real, for real. So, um, yeah, that's not the vibe. But I also am aware that, again, if people do open up, I think July is probably fair enough time to wait until right there's still some sun to be had um so some good weather you might have the ability to book a couple holidays here and there um the united states says um it's begun an uneven reopening uh, effort definitely you can see that um with certain localities such as austin and texas and springfield connecticut pushing to open bars and like a community eminently sorry um this is interesting Austin, especially Austin Texas, Texas sorry because I just heard from Joe Rogan's podcast that he mentioned that he's thinking about going to Texas um, because I don't he just can't put up with having to wait until was it end of July or maybe end of August or beginning of August to go back into the entertainment industry and do his stand up comedy and whatever um, I think if you live I think for the most part if you're a comedian and you're able to travel into LA easily or you'll get most of your money on the road it might make sense to live in a place like texas right live somewhere else and then you know do the road do like a quote-unquote tour prolonged tour for maybe a couple of months get your money come back and just do the clubs that are local to you weekend weekend in weekend out i think a lot of djs and artists probably might not probably not artists because i imagine if you're an artist um most of your money comes from the road or comes from touring so you have to go on tour repeat you can't necessarily just play local bars and clubs I'm not going to make it that way you have to play low or maybe yeah maybe it works for artists too you just do festivals right you do festivals or you do, and you do a tour back on the back of an album that you release but you then you don't you don't do a lot of you know gigs in random places same with djs too right you do like a tour maybe inland or you do like a tour maybe of some clubs in europe collect your coin but then you have a place that you play residency you have residency at for like every month and shit that might work as well i'm not too sure but i thought that joe rogan thing was interesting because i might that might speak f for an undercurrent of you know industry movers and shakers i think of doing the same thing because part of the reason why i think a lot of those guys live in la is because they live next to the comedy store right that's like the the burgain of the comedy the, of the comedy scene right like everyone wants to uh, perform there so if you live close to them you're able to kind of you know um scrimp save and get in with the right crowd you can essentially have access to play in front of some of the best crowds in the world when it comes to comedy in front of all the movers and shakers in the industry so that's why they're there but if they're not op uh, not willing to open until july which means that's the first round right then it might make sense to go to austin and it continues here it says uh the portugal the portuguese government has banned music festivals until september 30th they've come down quite hard on it, it? they've put a real line in the sand and it's also getting involved in refunds for ticket holders according to the eco it shows scheduled uh if shows scheduled between february 28th and 30th are not performed due to the covid19 pandemic uh the consumer will be provided with a voucher equal value to a ticket okay that's cool the push government again involved in that because there's been a, there's not a lot of festivals that have been very reluctant to give refunds which i understand in it i think a lot of 
at these festivals especially judging by what i've read from people's kickstarters and go me so it seems as if festivals are like club nights are like um are like a you know you just do them because you just want to you just want to throw you just put an event on you don't do them to make money it seems like for the most unless you're just unless you're those big ones you do them mostly just for the look just for the scene for the love just so you can you know uh call yourself the the mr scene star um so they don't make much money so a lot of these guys when they when they're doing their pre-orders and they're sending you a million emails about the tickets being sold out they usually do that because they need the funds to pay for people's flights pay for the down deposit on djs and shit get equipment sorted out insurance uh pay for security whatever they need the money right ahead of time so they do the pre-order you pre-order the tickets will go and then they use that money to basically get that festival up and running so if something like this happens like the covid um essentially all that money they've already spent it right and trying to get the festival up and running they don't have any of that cash in the account to actually refund you um and i'd imagine plus the fees on top it's just a complete horror show for their accounts so a lot of these clubs a lot of these festival houses are being reluctant to refund i understand it but I'd also like a lot of them to be a little bit more transparent explain the situation to their consumers or to their customers so that they can make a decision as to whether they will claim a refund or hold on tickets for next year because that's always an option isn't it? you can always defer your ticket so that you then the festival has more room to maneuver and make some plans for the, for the next situation of the festival but i also understand if you're if you bought a ticket in good faith think you're going to have it this year and you have plans you know you change your plan next year you don't want to go to a festival again and you know the ticket's more than a hundred dollars or 100 pounds even if it's 50 pounds it's your money in it you're, you're more than your rest so get it back i don't think you should be um you should feel guilty due to all the whole like you know save our scene bullshit like that's all media spend don't listen to that if you need a refund go get it um, it continues here ireland the irish government have got a 23 page document roadmap for reopening society and businesses outlines five phases and tentative time frames with the final stage to made today is august the 10th so everyone's sort of the same sort of time in it it seems july and august and germany has allowed for shops to reopen with social distancing measures which has been good news for the country's record stores of course and that also means for the country's spetty isn't it um once the space are open record stores are open people are definitely have loads of house raves i'm assuming in berlin um or in germany in general uh, the state of bavaria plans to reopen restaurants on may 18th really good news for them too according to bbc but there's no countrywide plan yet and bars and restaurants i like the staggered approaches based on the localities or the states or whatever maybe or the principalities whatever they call them in these european countries i think that's a good approach especially if you have a population that isn't that affected by covid you want to try something different because i think it seems like a lot of the governments are just stuck right now that the, the easy choice to make when covid broke out was to lock everything down and get people to stay indoors right close all businesses but now that we've got some more information we've got some data points this is where informed decisions about in opening need to be made some risk taking needs to be done but people are just so i think politicians are so worried about getting it wrong right because you know i guess we're in election year or you want to get re-elected or you know you have a taste of power you don't let it go so they're worried about opening up anything and just in case something happens and then suddenly everyone blames you for that thing which you know is unfair really because i think even if you're not a fan of trump and he's been saying some wild shit or you know if i'm boris he's been saying some wild shit or not saying some nothing actually you can't really you know you can't really say it's their fault they might have handled it poorly but i think everyone's come out of this poorly right except for maybe new zealand there's not a lot of countries that have got like a b plus right everyone's got like a c and down right um in their kind of reaction and how they've dealt with covid so i don't know I, I would like to see more experimentation as to how people reopen and how people do stuff right um especially again if you're not affected in the area you win try to be a bit different let's see how it goes um because i don't think people can stay indoors for you know all year round that isn't especially you know when it comes to the economy it just isn't going to work out unless you know, especially if the government aren't coming in and saying they're going to support people here and there you know we're just going to reopen and just have hordes of fucking print and mcdonald's open and no independent business which is going to be sad 
It continues here. Last one says Spain lockdown easing allows more cultural events to take place uh, starting this month on May 11th. Outdoor terraces and restaurants and bars will be allowed to open at 50% capacity and no more than 30 people will be permitted uh, to attend indoor events. So the, those numbers are just nutty in it. For the final phase planned June 10th, the capacity in indoor events rises to 80 people while outdoor functions can host up to 800 people in seats. There's more details. Click here though. Jesus. I just don't know how people are going to survive businesses wise man like you know if you've got a restaurant or a bar what do you do like it's mad isn't it it really is mad you've literally got no way of making money apart from the money that you make that when you have your bar open that's it literally that's it nothing else it's insane but hey what do I know let's move on to something else that I thought was of interest Oh, let's go to this one because I think this was cool, isn't it? Because I think this, um, in terms of what I plan to do when COVID is over, because that's a big one. Eh? A lot of people are talking about what they want to do. I want to do that. I want to go here. I want to go there. But one thing I'm definitely sure about doing um, once COVID is over is getting back into martial arts. Something that I've, uh, well, I, I did briefly, uh, maybe a couple of years ago. I got into I got back into doing Muay Thai, which I did before when I was in school. Then I got back into it. Um, I did uh, I did like these you know these Groupon sessions. It might be like twenty quid for like for a month's classes, and I just sacked it off after a month. But I've really enjoyed it. To be fair, I, you know I found it difficult to get my hand eye coordination going, or my coordination of my legs. You know, usually just using all my limbs as weapons is a bit difficult to do, especially at this age. But I find it a good release. And again, I like the idea of being able just to defend myself when it comes to any kind of physical altercation, which I don't get into. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going around trying to headbutt people, you know, in the middle of a fold. Um, but it's nice to know that, you know, when something does happen, when someone does, you know, slap the chips out of your hand, like you're some kid in a secondary school, that you can, you know, walk their head off their shoulders. And I thought this video was a very good um uh, summation of just how important it is to be able to defend yourself and also a really good um, video because it should tell us we shouldn't judge the book by its cover because I think judging by these people and judging by what they look like right I would have never thought that one of these guys could fight of course you know you, you're expecting one two or both of them can't fight but to think that one person can actually fight fight I was like, wow, really, really impressed, man. And his technique was pretty solid. So this is two, I don't know, the, the, the video's been titled um, Jeff, Go Jeff Goldblum beats up a crackhead, but they both look a bit methy, right? I'm not sure if it's in the States or something, but they both got that kind of like methy look. The one on the left has got like a methy flabby look. The guy on the right has got that, the, obviously the methy skinny look. Um, one has his top off with keys dangling. The other one, you know, looks like he's got a fleece on and some tech you know are they tech twos no i don't know tech twos maybe even vapor flies nikes you know just general average everyday people and it starts off they're in this pavement and they just start fighting and then one of them just goes full fucking mma and that's brittany obliterates <laughs> to the ribs i think that's when you realize right, when you're in the street fight when you know you're, fight, you're fighting someone that can actually fight fight when they kick you that's when you know you should run every fight i've seen online fight porn subreddit um whilst i hip-hop fight compilations um madness you might see on live leak if someone kicks you right or if someone starts bouncing on the spot or they've got their or, the, or they're bouncing their one foot up like muay thai style right their front foot muay thai style either take them to the ground or run they know what they're doing but if someone does that kind of you know that bad man sort of like you know 1922 aye, sir, sort of fighting you know you can fuck him up but if someone starts kicking you in the ribs <sighs> boom just the kick skinny guy gets it right hand boom kick to the ribs so just starts fake roundhouse kick bang boom bang bang body body to the body uppercut Touch him on the ribs, thinks I'm not gonna do it. Then he's like, you know what, fuck this guy. Bang! One last shot in the ribs and the guy staggers off. He got absolutely wrecked, mate. Look, he staggers off, panting out of breath and towards a tree to get some support. 
but yeah, that just made me think, you know what, I'm definitely not telling how to fight this year, especially once the lockdown's over. Um, it's such an... It, <laughs> It's such a great life skill, man. It's such a, it must fill you with such confidence to know that you're able to defend yourself in most situations. Because I think for the most part, most people that are fighting you on the streets aren't necessarily people that know how to defend themselves either, right? Mostly. If you know how to defend yourself, there's this sort of oath or this understanding that because you know what you're doing, that you should take yourself away from the situation, never putting yourself in harm's way. But if somebody's coming up to you in the street, most likely they're not, they probably think they're tougher than what they are. And, you know, the moment you step back and start bouncing on your toes and you hit him with a roundhouse kick to the side of the jaw, everything changes. And that's a, that's the humbling part about fighting. It's similar to, like, sports, isn't it? You just win or you lose. There is no middle ground, isn't it? Like, you can't say you drew. A f- I've never been in a fight where it was a draw. I think there might have been a couple, but there were, like, legendary fights in the area, right, where these guys were just going at it for, like, out minutes. It seems like hours, but it was, like, a couple of minutes. And you're like, bloody hell. And of course, the adrenaline probably, you know, uh, blurs the verdict of the fight a bit, but it doesn't necessarily exist. There's no such thing as draws. You Either you win or you lose. And when you lose, you lose, lose. When you win, you win, win. There is no, like, middle ground either. You know when you've won. You know when you've lost the fight. And that feeling of just like, Ugh, that guy just got the better of me. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing I can do, but I could, I could get angry again. But he's just proven that he knows what he's doing with his body more than I know what I'm doing with mine. And it's like, Ugh, God damn it, man. You gotta let him have it. You then go back to the drawing board. When you see him again, you catch him slipping. Or in my case, if you catch him slipping, you just throw a fucking trolley at his head and then keep that bouncing in it. But yeah, I don't know, man. That's definitely one of my goals for the new year. Um, not for the new year, I'm saying as if the year's over. No, once lockdown's over, that's what I'm doing. I'm getting back into mixed martial arts training for sure. Um, or just doing mixed martial arts. See, I wasn't going, that's what I wasn't doing. I was doing Muay Thai, wasn't I? Yes, I'm gonna do mixed martial arts training. Go, go to probably London Fight Zone or something, get a pass and just start training, you know, a couple of days a week. Um, get my sets and reps in. For sure, I'm going to be, I'm going to get smashed. Anytime a bigger dude like me walks in, which, you know, they don't necessarily have many bigger dudes go in and people want someone to hang around so they can spar with, they usually always pair you up with an absolute animal. So that's always the sad part of it. But, you know, it is what it is. What can you do? Um, let's move on a little bit here. What else do I have on the list I wanted to talk to you about? Da, da, da. We're not going to talk about Chris, Chris and Tegan because that's just annoying. Um, let's move on. McDonald's is reopening. That's some good news a little bit for those of you that want burgers. I've missed McDonald's, I'm not going to lie, during lockdown. I really miss being able to order cheeky delivery uh, d- delivery eats. Oof. Getting late. And Uber Eats. I've missed that ability to do that. Um, but they're gonna reopen. I think a few restaurants at a time. There's none near me that are opening today or tomorrow. It's not happening. But it's all gonna be delivery, which is you know, I guess no one's complaining. It's interesting, isn't it? Everyone that's complaining about work is going back to work. Well, that's you know, posted pictures of people on the on the train, uh, commuting in the morning. They don't necessarily have any. I don't know. They don't have any reservations about Uber Eats offering. The ability for you to get stuff delivered to your door. No one cares about that shit anymore. You know what I mean? They just want the convenience of getting their stuff back. Or, they, or people just want the ability to go back out again and order their McDonald's themselves again. That might be something nice as well, isn't it? That's a nice thing to have. Instead of, you know, sitting at home and ordering that shit. Um, I, I actually like picking it up. That would be quite cool. So you get, the, you get the chance to go for a walk. And you don't have to kind of have a guy put the thing in his bag and, you know make the journey across and get himself involved in an accident and you feel super bad about it so maybe that's a thing I don't know let's move on what did I see on the thing that I thought was of interest so there was something else I liked what was it da, da, da. let's go okay that was not there go back over here then oh there was a, a picture here or some image or some video of a Zara I'm not sure where this is it's in the airport somewhere that's reopened why you'd want to go to Zara <laughs> Why that would be your first port of call is beyond me, but this is a, a tweet that someone uploaded. It says, the airport is closed, locking all domestic workers in countrywide prison, but Zara Fashion Store is open. <laughs> so I'm guessing this is the Zara in the airport, um, maybe because some they're operating a limited service um, in terms of flights that they're able to open the store. I'm not too sure. It's actually news to me. I'm not sure. Where does this person live? Let's hover over their profile. They haven't put in there. No address. But it, um, interesting, isn't it? But imagine this being the first place you go. Because I don't... Are you in a mood to shop right now? 
So why was the stock? They must have loads of shit from the summer, and now I'm assuming they're kind of you know phasing some bits out. Maybe they've got their all winter notebooks out and stuff, and you know the bigger jackets are coming in. What do they do with the stock if you're Zara? Do you just burn that stuff, or do you put them and do you just distribute them around the stores and mark them down and hope people buy them? Yeah, I'd hope obviously the probably the latter I'd assume in it, but there's gonna be a lot of surplus stock in it. And Zara stuff I'm assuming doesn't necessarily last the longest. I've I've only bought a couple of things from there over the years but i would imagine stuff that you want to wear day in day out doesn't last that long i mean zara so bloody hell man like i said the last thing i want to do after this lockdown is go into a shop it's like, it's like going to primark is your first port of call that is insane that's some whack job shit to go to Primark. Imagine straight after everything's finished. But again, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I feel bad saying it because it's judgmental because some people just need a release, isn't it? Being indoors all the time isn't normal. That's not what we should be doing. So, if, you know, in the same way people are getting annoyed by people that go to, what's it, Victoria Park and Columbia Road Flower Market, people need a release. They need to feel like, you know, life is worth living <laughs> right so having just a bit just to walk down that columbia phone fly market even though there's no flowers right just to kind of walk down and see someone cute smile you know listen to your music whatever it may be that might be enough to keep you going a couple more weeks so maybe if a girl or a guy wants to go zara and buy themselves some skinny jeans with some zips on their knee pads and fair enough in it let them do it but me going to a shop the first poor court after everything gets locked out nah one the one thing I want to do is go to a, a basement bar somewhere and order a whiskey, right? And listen to a jukebox or some shit, or talk to the bartender and ask them how they've you know how their experience has been, you know? Or read a book somewhere next to a candlelit table with a whiskey again, right? Like that's what I'd like to do. Or go to a restaurant. Um, that's probably a nice thing to do, right? After lockdown's ended, but go to a shop to buy some clothes. <laughs> Now, if anything, this lockdown has told me I've got too many clothes that I don't necessarily wear. I need to get rid of stuff as opposed to buy stuff or maybe buy more quality things. Get some staples in my wardrobe, right? Um, you know, a staple trench coat, a staple uh, leather jacket, a couple of staple denims, a uh, staple denim, ja denim jacket for the most part, shirts, suits, whatever. Those things I need more as opposed to going to Zara and buying some trendy seasonal clothes that are going to be out of fashion within, what, a minute? And again, who are Zara jacking their designs off of? All this time, there's been no fashion weeks, right? Fashion week has been has been done for a while. Where is Zara going to get their inspiration from? Anyways, we move on. What else did I see that I thought was of interest on the web? More Zara news there from Switzerland, I think that might have been. Or maybe it might have been an Islam Islamic country based upon the... Um, head wraps i saw some of the ladies wearing but that is another topic for another day what else is on here angela day we're talking about violence okay let's move back onto the list see if anything else i want to end it on bish bash bosh oh this is a good one so twitter is now allowing um all their employees to work from home indefinitely which i think is a great thing and probably something i'm assuming their workforce has probably thought has been long overdue um, but also I think it marks a change in work culture um, in general worldwide. Um, I've never really been the biggest fan of working in offices anyway, especially conventional open plan uh, workspaces, because for the most part, if you've worked in any, even corporate companies, startups, the idea that you get any work done working in an open plan work, 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 work workforce or workflow whatever it's called is preposterous it's not going to get no work done especially deep work you need time to um concentrate and lock in and that doesn't necessarily you know work well with people being able to shout across a room at you and get your attention i think the back in the day offices where you had rooms and doors and people were sectioned off worked really well but this convoluted idea that happened you know during a startup era where there was this idea that you were all going to collaborate because you sat next to finance and you could look over their table or look over his monitor and say something was preposterous it never really worked out if anything it probably increased um 
isolation where people just you know bring big noise cancelling headphones in or put in their earbuds and not talk to anyone unless it was their friend wanting to get attention for lunch um and again productivity is never the game it doesn't make no sense we're all connected we're all got laptops we'll have internet you can do the same work you're doing um at home at work so at work at home but then I guess one of the things that helps with the workspace is that you have like a dedicated place where you can go meet your colleagues and, you know, brainstorm ideas, do uh, what they call called sprints or whatever they may be called. Yes, something on those kind of lines. You can do that as a little group and I think that will probably work better. But of course, most companies are resistant, I guess, to that kind of thing. They probably think that they need to keep an eye on their workforce. They're not very um open to the idea of allowing people to do that so i get it that it's a big step for people to make but i think when twitter does something i think a lot of companies will notice and take heed and i think this story will reverberate around the world and we'll definitely see a lot of changes again like i said i think i said previously in a couple of podcasts i think just in terms of just cost alone i'm assuming a lot of companies have probably revised how much are going to revise how much they spend in rent most companies don't think there's any company actually maybe there's a handful that actually own the building that they uh, have their workforce in mostly people are renting places especially if you're somebody that works in we works you know that right renting of somebody is renting 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 so um you've saved a lot of money with the workspaces that you usually have people working in week in week out your um productivity is still where it needs to be because I think contrary to popular belief, people that have the ability to work from home usually take their job a little bit more seriously because they feel as if they have to give a bit more because they don't want to seem like they're taking the piss. So it works all the way around, really. You give people a bit of leeway, give them the ability to work from home, um, uh, be a little bit more flexible with their time schedule. They're able then to give you full, undivided attention in their work when they're doing their work, right, in big solid chunks. I've realized myself... I could work between you know two to three hours uninterrupted at home and there's no way I can get that kind of work done working in a workspace anyway it's not going to happen so this is this is an article I think from business to, from BuzzFeed News actually let's get it up here on the screen that was shared on Twitter um, it says Twitter will now allow employees to work from home forever uh, it says the following this article says uh, duh, duh. Um, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey emailed employees on Tuesday telling them that they would la- be allowed to work from home permanently even after the coronavirus pandemic lockdown passes some jobs that require physical presence such as maintaining servers will still require employees to come in which is I think perfect isn't it right um, it says here um, we've always been thoughtful in how we've approached this from the time we were the first companies to move from a work from home model a Twitter spokesman told BuzzFeed News will continue to be and will continue to put the safety of our people and the communities first twitter encourages employees to work from home early in march as the coronavirus began to spread across the u.s several tech companies did the same including microsoft google and amazon that month twitter human resources head jennifer christie told buzzfeed news um company that never probably be the same in the structure of his work would definitely true and i think that's definitely for the better i think if you're able to get your most of your workforce to work from home and then get the upper management to be in the office maybe a little bit more or maybe you know a couple more a couple more days than everyone else i think that builds a different kind of work structure too a different kind of culture and then i also think it allows the company more flexibility and more opportunity to do more interesting things when it comes to like the you know the some summer retreats or like the winter holidays christmas parties you could do more interesting things when you're not necessarily in each other's face all the time and it makes those events a bit more interesting too for people that attend them no i think well, the one that would be more fun especially if you're not seeing each other every thursday every friday um you get to meet up during the summer holidays or quarterly parties and stuff i think that works out pretty well so it really could change the way human resources is kind of handled as well in companies so money saved uh, people are more fulfilled they feel more happy too i'd imagine because you don't feel as if like because i think that's part of the reason a lot of people have a lot of you know have a lot of negative things to say about the place that they work because it feels like you're never you're never not there you wake up early you leave late you get there early again so it just feels like you know you're there all the time nothing ever changes but if you've got the ability to work from home a bit it kind of gives you this false impression that you aren't at work all the time right you can maybe nip off to the gym a little bit later in the morning you could probably meet your friends after work and go out for drinks and come back a little bit earlier it kind of makes life a little bit more manageable i'd say it continues here so people who were reticent reticent sorry to work 
remotely will find that they will really thrive that way Chris has said managers who didn't think they could manage teams that were remote will have a different perspective I don't I do think we won't go back which is definitely true I think again it depends on the teams depends on the structure but I definitely think being able having the ability to maybe coming in once a week or once every two weeks for team meetings and stuff is probably crucial or maybe do Monday meetings all the time and then you just work from home Tuesday uh, to Friday that would be fucking sick but there's a real good way to do it and again I just think in terms of actually doing w good work if that's what you want to do and actually making an impact and moving the needle this is probably the best way to go about things as opposed to having people just sit indoors sit in the office and pretend like they're working and being on ebay all day it says in this, uh, uh the jack the jack uh, dorsey announced that the company intends to work in a disturbed distributed way before the virus but the pandemic forced the company to move the timeline up He's, this email Dorsey said it's unlikely Twitter would open its offices before September wow that business travel will be cancelled until then as well with very few exceptions the company will also cancel all in-person events for the rest of the year and reassess its plan for 2021 later this year finally Twitter upped its allowance for work from home suppliers to 1000 to all employees again absolutely incredible news I think it's great to see hopefully we see a lot more companies doing it probably it's probably uh, more encouragement to the more corporate uh fuddy daddy companies are a little bit you know stuck in their ways i think they will probably need more encouraging because i think most startups will do it because they want to seem cool and they want to have the ability to attract new employees once everything's settled as well you know hey we offer work from home that will go a long way you know it'll probably go more of a that might be the new carrot you know people usually do oh we do friday drinks is the thing in it to kind of get you to sign on the dotted line maybe the new way to get more in, to get new hires might be to be like hey guys we offer unlimited work from home unlimited holidays and what sort of shit um bit gay but you know it might work for some people anyway that's the hour of the show there one hour one hour one hour completed all on a new mic hope that made a difference hope i sounded very clear um, as per usual, thank you so much for tuning into the Excellent Zinger Show. This is episode number 312, I think. If you want any more information regarding myself, more information regarding the DJ mixes I do, blog posts as I write, and some links to my social media, definitely check out my website. That's excellentzinger.com. Find that in the show notes description or find that in the description of the podcast app if you're listening via there. If you're watching via YouTube, of course, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think of the show. And if you're listening via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review and share it with all your family and friends. But until tomorrow, I guess, my friends, hang in there. Uh, make sure you got your mask on. But take your well antibiotics. Is that a thing? Are people doing antibiotics during lockdown? I don't think they are. But whatever you're taking, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Don't OD. Hang in there, and I'll see you guys again next week. No, tomorrow. Next week. <laughs> I'm joking. Take care. Be safe. Bye. <laughs>